Good Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the VaultQuest.com podcast. The whole gang is all here. Rob Lewis, Jesse Simon, Austin Price, I'm Brent Hubbs. Glad to have you along with us on this Tuesday. And what it's a very different month, but it is a version of the silly season. It's not about as much about recruiting, although we'll dive into recruiting uh, throughout this podcast and certainly going to talk basketball as well. But the, the thing out there right now is, you know, coaching moves and, you know, guys moving around. We see that Baylor has an opening now. Matt Rule's taking the job with the Carolina Panthers, so they've got a spot to fill. You've got Mississippi State. Um, looks like they're closing in on where they're going to go, and then the shuffling really begins with assistant coaches and all those things. We know Jeremy Pruitt has an opening, uh, as David Johnson has left for Florida State. Um, Austin, I'll start with you. Th this one seems like it's, I don't want to say cut and dry the one individual, but it seems like it's pretty cut and dry in terms of what the, the quote, hot board for that position looks like, at least right now, right? Yeah, I mean, it does, and, uh, you know, I mean, at this current moment, I don't think Jeremy's in any kind of rush, you know. And so I don't expect – like, I don't think it's going to drag on six weeks like Jim Chaney did, but I don't think it's going to come to an end this weekend, though, either. You know what I mean? I, I think Jeremy's going to take his time. Um, you know, obviously, you know, he, he's, he's got options and, you know – you know, Jay Graham, Montreal Hardesty. I, there's a you know there's relationships on this staff with a guy like Des Kitchings, um, you know, uh, elsewhere. I don't think they're you know and Jesse said this. I don't think they're promoting Joe Osavet. I'm not gonna just say they won't because I guess anything could happen, especially if Jeremy has you know more change and ends up you know going in different directions at other positions. But it does not feel like Joe Osavet will be a guy that they promote uh, on this staff. And so um, you know. I, I think Jay will have a shot, but the question is, is you know, how, how much kind of how much money is Jay going to command, you know, to come back here? Um, the salary thing I think is going to be a big deal in this deal because I mean, let's face it, I mean, Jeremy's got a lot of money tied up in some assistant coaches, and when you factor in both coordinators are over a million dollars, Will Friends at eight hundred, Rumps at over eight hundred, Shares at seven hundred, Rockers at five. I mean, that's uh, he's got a bunch of money. Like a lot of money when you say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but here and here's the thing, and, and I've mentioned this, or I've got this in, the, in my three, two, one for football that's coming up. Jesse, you know, one of the prediction, that my prediction that I'm making in the three, two, one is that Philip Fulmer is going to have to get the checkbook out because look, they won eight games. Nobody got an extension or a raise last year, with the exception of Brian Niedermeyer. You, you're going to have to, you're going to have to pay your staff. I'm not saying you got guys getting. Hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollar raises, but everybody's going to get an extension, and and whoever's on your staff, you know, with maybe the exception of Cheney and and Ansley, you have a lot of guys have new deals, including the head coach. Well, I think that's why basic question, Austin. How much more movement do we see other than just David Johnson? I think the expectation, as I sit here on January seventh, is that he will certainly not be the only staff member that was on this 2019 staff that is elsewhere next season. Now, we know that Rumpf, uh, or excuse me, we know that Rocker and Winky have expiring deals. Do they get re-upped, you know, come I think in Winky January, does. beginning of February? Okay. So at, we, no, at, at, at no more money, though. Right. Yeah, so same. What happens with Tracy? What happens with a guy like Rumpf, who, who has never stayed long, you know, at a lot anywhere. of spots? Anywhere. I mean, he, he, he stayed for a while at Clemson. But since then, he's bebopped around Alabama, Florida, Tennessee. Uh, you know, I would not be surprised if, if, if he explores options. We know that T is looking around potentially. I don't think T you know, just wants to leave Tennessee, but AP, if a play calling opportunity presents itself, he's not getting to do that here. So it would make sense if he wants to kind of elevate his, or continue his career. So I, I just don't think David Johnson is going to be the last staff movement here. So to your point about contracts and that – that there's going to be some uh, shuffling that takes place because some of these guys are expensive where maybe you get some other guys who are a little bit younger. A little more uh, hungrier recruiters. Yeah, and, and, and you, you know, you sign them on for a three-year deal a little bit cheaper. We'll see. Well, and I think, Rob, if you're Jeremy Pruitt, that's part of the reason why maybe you're not in a rush. I mean, first of all, I mean, you can't go on the road and recruit again until January the 16th. Tennessee's got a limited number of spots, and we'll dive into that part of it in just a few minutes in the podcast. But if you're Jeremy Pruitt, you don't have to – part of the reason why you don't necessarily feel something in an immediate hurry is you've got your pool of assistance money. How deep is your pool? And that may depend on 
what Jesse's talking about with some other potential moves out there. So maybe you don't plug and play and fill the one spot you have now and wait and see what else opens up. You kind of let it marinate a little bit and see what all you have to fill I mean, I, moving forward. I think that's totally accurate because, I mean, if, if, if Rump's you – know, and I don't, we're not, I'm not saying these guys are moving. I'm just saying that, I mean, this happens every year. You know, guys move. And if you lose – you know, you suddenly have an $800,000 hole in your – your salary pooled, and that's a that's a lot of money to play with when you're talking about hiring a running backs coach, hiring a outside linebackers coach, and also as you alluded to, you know there's three or four spots left on the board. It's not like you've got to get something done so you could be full staffed up for recruiting. AP and I were talking about this yesterday off air, but the fact that Jeremy was able to kind of come in here in year one, um, and I think AP and I agree, Tennessee probably overpaid for some of these assistants. But that that raised the, the the pool is deeper from the start than it was for a lot of first year coaches, right. and so he has uh, some leeway there depending on what happens. And as Rob just said, if if you suddenly have an eight hundred thousand, that's a lot of money that you have to play with. If you, and we're just talking about maybe one guy, so when you have several of those, that you know he 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 will have some money to play with, and the guys that are here. They, they will get raises, and my, they will get extensions because, you know, Tennessee won eight games this year. My question is, and AP, Jesse, you got – in the running backs hire, is it more about the coach or is it more about recruiting, specifically Memphis, I mean, after what I, David Johnson just got done? Well, I won't say Memphis because I, I think that you can plug in different guys there. I think more it's more about recruiting, handling your room – you know, because that's that's the easiest position to coach. It, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I mean, I mean I, not, I, not to disparage David Johnson, but just yeah, it's I mean, been able to handle the rotation the right way during in game. You know, but I, I th- ultimately, I think it ends up coming back down to recruiting, and, and I think that you know, if you know, if, let's say Chris Rumpf goes to another job, um, you know, I think that that position will be a lot about recruiting as well. You know, I think that's how Jeremy will 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 look at it. You know, he's he's not, he doesn't want to hire a slappy coach. Sure. So, but uh, he wants to guy, get the guy that can recruit the best that can handle the room. Well, you got development. I mean, there's lots of factors there, but I think the recruiting factor after, if you're Jeremy Pruitt and you've been on this job for two years, um, you've recruited in a couple of cycles now. You know, this is your third recruiting cycle. The one, first one maybe is a throwaway, but it was probably an eye opener too mm-hmm. of, hey, what's it like to recruit? Now that you've been through it, you have a better sense of the challenges of recruiting to Tennessee, where you need some, you know, for your geographical footprint, if you need help in a specific region, that type of thing. I mean, I I think, I'm not going to use your phrase that you use with Tyson Helton in a mulligan, because this is not a mulligan situation, but the reality is if you have turnover, you've got to, you've got to improve, okay? Yeah, you can't regress. You can't can't regress. But the improvement for, for Jeremy Pruitt may lie more in the recruiting element of it than it does in, in, the, in the pure coaching or pure development aspect of well, it. Well, I think there's probably also a heightened sense of we had a nice class this year, but Florida actually recruited better than I think people thought they were going to recruit, and they were better than us this past season. So we still have some catching up to do in that point. Obviously, they're all still t- chasing – Alabama, Georgia, LSU, you know, to begin with. Uh, so you can't get left behind. And, you know, again, AP and I talked about this right before the podcast started recording. The 2021 crop in state is not nearly as good as it was this past cycle. So you don't have that luxury of being able to be, hey, stay home, close to mama, come play for the, you know, the, the big orange in state. There are some guys, Turrentine, Curry, and some other guys, but it's not nearly as loaded as it was this cycle, which then means where do you have those geographical advantages and how quickly can you kind of spread your wings and make hay with the Peyton Pages and, and the Hendersons and those kind of guys? Well, you've got to recruit the Carolinas and the Virginia very well. You know, and that's where, you know, whether it be Hardesty or Kitchings or Jay Graham, all those guys have ties in those areas. You know, uh, which are areas that Tennessee used to recruit really, really well and, you know, got away from it and then other schools got better and then they started just kind of kind of bullying their way into those territories and Tennessee kind of got blocked out. But, you know, Tennessee, you know, recruited North Carolina, has, has recruited North Carolina okay under Jeremy. They've been more of a factor there, at least, you know, taking swings than they were under Butch. Um, so They kind of backed off that state this year. They did. 
They did, but I mean, you know, I think that they're go- you, you look at that, you know, that list of twenty one for twenty one that you, you know we yeah. put out, and there's several North Carolina kids on there. Yeah, and there's, there's a bunch of Alabama too, which is funny. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I mean, I was asked this in the chat. I mean, it, it you know that's I understand that they that they like the Alab- the state of Alabama and ever and all that. And they've got all their ties there. I, I don't care. I don't care if your dad was the mayor or the governor of the state of Alabama. It's going to be hard to go in there and beat out Alabama and Auburn. What about the dog catcher? You know, um, whereas North Carolina, you have a better chance, although Mac Brown's causing you some problems there. Clemson's certainly a problem there. Virginia Tech is Georgia goes into state. North Carolina. Georgia, I mean, the thing about the state of North Carolina, though, is you look at it, <coughs> kids have always left that state. <coughs> Even when Mac had it, got North Carolina on the map 20 years ago, Kids still left the state of North Carolina, and, and and this past year, kids left the state of North Carolina. I mean, so I, I think it's a situation where you can. It's easier to go into North Carolina and get a kid out of there than it is to go in and get a totally. kid that everybody in the, in the state of Carolina wants, as opposed to going into the state of Alabama and beating out Auburn and Alabama. No question. For a kid. I mean, well, I mean, you're still no matter how good Carolina gets under Mike Brown, you're going to be the, the second favorite program of every fan of the university, I mean, just like Kentucky. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Except there's more players in North Carolina. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it's a, I mean it's a great underrated state. What do you say? Yeah, I mean there's been a lot of lot of good a lot of good guys put put out there. I, I, back to the contract deal. If you're Philip Fulmer, what are you doing with Jeremy Pruitt? I, and I looked this up. I mean Drinkowitz is making four million, um, which is just gross. Sa- I mean Sam That's Pittman's terrible. making less. I don't know what Mississippi State's going to pay for 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 their hire. Yeah, Pittman, Pitt, Pittman was smart. He actually took less money and got, to your point, about he got a deep salary pool, which is he's able to pay $1 million well, and he for got Bryles. the job by taking less money. That's too. what I'm saying. He, but, and it, he, he did that and got Bryles for a million, got Odom for a million, uh, has filled well, out What are you making, staff. three? It's like 3-2 or something. Yeah. But, it's, it was, but it's, there's a lot of incentive yeah. laden stuff in there, too. But, but he, he did take less money. He, he was smart, whereas Drinkowitz, is, it, you know, he went for all the money he could get right <laughs> away, and, and I'm not sure what sort of staff he's putting together. I mean, I, I would think that Jeremy <laughs> would have to get, you know, a uh, uh, – a, a, at least a two-year extension. And don't you think yeah, Phil- he didn't get one last year? Don't, don't you, take it, make it whole again? And I was going to say, five. don't you think Phillips anxious to get his football coach making as much as his basketball coach, or more? Uh, I mean, I, I think. I mean, I think he wants a little a balance there. Now, you know, the the Barnes deal is so unusual because all the bonus stuff is being paid outside of the university. Exactly, which um, is something a lot of people don't understand. You know, so it's. I mean, that that's a. That's the crazy part of, of that contract because we've never seen that at Tennessee. That, that all the bonus structure, which I mean, it, a lot of that's very easily attainable, uh, but that's coming from outside the university's pocket. I mean, I, I think he's got to go. I mean, I think you're probably taking him, you know, to the four-two range, four-one, four-two range. And was he three-eight now? You, you got to pay him more than Drinkowitz. I mean, he can't. I mean, I just don't think he can be the twelfth highest paid coach no. in the SEC. What did Lane, what, what did Lane get? He, Lane's making more money. Lane's new deal is more money than what Jeremy is. Yeah, see, Jeremy should be making more, more, more money than Lane. You know, so Jimmy Sexton's out there wheeling and dealing. He, he's going to going to broker that one. And, that, and that's my point. When you talk about this month or the next two months, Philip Fulmer's going to get the checkbook out because Tennessee, you know, and the only the only benefit to Philip to, for Philip Fulmer and the University to Jeremy losing to Georgia State and BYU is that you're not having to write a huge check. Because if you'd have won those two games <laughs> and you win ten games in the season, then the, then the you know the check that you're writing is very different. But you're going to have to give him a raise because he can't be the eleventh or twelfth paid coach. The yeah, honestly, I would not be surprised if it gets as, if it go if it's as high as four or five. You think he'd go that much? I uh, if now that we're just talking thinking about Lane's deal, thinking about Drinkowitz, thinking about what Will makes, you know, I would. I wouldn't be surprised if it's around, you know, make it whole and, and put it at four or five. Yeah. Now, again, his, his salary pool is pretty deep because of what Tennessee's paying. Cheney is the highest OC, and Ansley's making 1-1, one, one, and Will Friend's making, you know, 900 or 850. Uh, they got all his beer money now, though. Yeah, oh, for selling in the state. Well, here's the other thing. They're too. about to get a ton of money with this new SEC and, deal. And everybody's <laughs> spending that money before they ever yeah. see it, you know. I mean, because that's – and that's a whole separate topic, but, but touching it quickly, I mean, the SEC on CBS was, I think, $55 million yeah. annually. It's getting ready to get. And it's getting ready to go to, like, $350 million I mean, dollars annually. I mean, I, I honestly could – I don't know what the distribution and everything's going to look like, but I can honestly see where – I mean, SEC coaches are, are paid like NFL guys. Because, I mean, 
it's you can't pay the players the money. You got to do something with the money. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah. You're talking about potentially another twenty million dollars into the coffers of athletic departments for the football deal. Yep. Do, you know, for, do, and, just and, for the football TV deal, and, and that could be happening as soon as uh 2021. Yeah, because I mean, the, the scuttle is is that ESPN is already trying to buy out. CBS's remaining years so that next season 2020 is is the last year uh, of, of CBS on ESPN and every, or CBS on, SEC on CBS. And, <laughs> and, every, and every head coach's agent is telling every AD hey don't tell me you don't have money because I know what's coming right we know what's coming down the pike so that's going to be um, really interesting watch quickly on the on the T Martin uh, situation I, I, I've talked to T I, I mentioned this in the chat T's not on the record ready to say anything at this point in time. I'm, I, I'm not saying he's leaving, um, and I'm not saying the report that he's staying was wrong or is wrong. He, he may very well – I think there's a very real chance he's back here next year. But if the phone rings, I think T. Martin's going to feel phone calls and listen. If it's a play-calling opportunity, I think that's very intriguing to him. Uh, but knowing T since T was a high school junior – Going into his senior year, it's always fluid. It's yeah. He's he's always gonna he's always gonna listen. I think he's always been that way, and I think that's the way he. Well, and if you be. if he wants to advance his career, he's gonna have to check that box at some point in time. Well, at the end, I mean, of as a play caller, I mean, it, that's at, something more than a figurehead OC. At the end of the day, you're right. Guys like Derek Ansley, T. Martin, Brian Niedermeyer, that are sharp, articulate, can recruit, are good in homes. Man, they go get calls every year no matter whether they're here or not i mean when derrick ansley was in the alabama he got calls from the nfl when he was in the nfl he got a call from jeremy to come back you know, and it's, it's and like you know, the old saying goes if people are calling to try to hire guys on your staff then your you, staff's not very you good. need to take a look at your staff yeah and, and i you know i think there are exceptions out there with what you know Dabo sweeney he got he got plucked this year a little bit for the first time uh you know he's had more continuity than, than other anybody coaches. else i don't think he, i don't think coaches around the country jesse want what Nick Saban went through when you're replacing half of your staff on a regular annual basis, because I do think you need a little more continuity than that. But the fact of the matter is, this month is always going to be about potential change, because I just think that's the way the marketplace is. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think every, every head coach, especially younger head coaches, would like to have kind of a couple rider dies, you know, guys right. that are going to stay with them. And, and that's what Dabo had. I mean, in Scott and some of those guys, those are guys that refused to leave him. The, the D-line coach, the O-line, you know, those are guys that uh, called. Well, those guys have been there forever. Saban had that, you know, during the first run of this decade with Pruitt and Kirby and those guys. You know, they were there. Right. Um, uh, but then the domino effect of those two guys become head coaches and they start plucking your staffs and other guys – you know, so Jeremy will eventually feel that same thing. At some point, someone's going to give Derek Ansley a call to be a head coach. Now, I don't think it's going to happen in the next year or two, but it, it, it will. It, eventually, somebody will happen. That will happen, and, and so you'll feel that. So it, those guys are going to take calls. You know, it, it's to be expected that I think both sides, uh, both Jeremy Pruitt and – some of his staff are going to continue to kind of explore all options. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about that. All right, the next night, date of note, we're going to talk about this over the course of the next two weeks, is January 20th, and that's the NFL deadline. That's what Trey Smith has until January the 20th to make his decision on what he wants to do. I'm not saying it's going to go that long, Austin, but I, I, don't, I think he does have some time to ponder it, to sleep on it, to think about it, um, you know, moving forward as he continues to, to gather his information. I think the interesting thing with Trey and in, in, in my talking with, with people just about that whole situation is the question that Trey is trying to get an answer to is how realistic, how much can I realistically improve my stock between now and this time next year if I come back? Do I further answer a medical question that satisfies the NFL to where that's not a huge red flag for me when I go and, and, I, and I go through the physicals and all of those things. If that's the case, then the idea of moving from the third round way up the charts could be very possible for him. I think those are the types of answers he's, he's exploring. There's no doubt he loves the college experience. He likes being here. I think he's enjoying his time at Tennessee. And it's not necessarily ready to run out the door. I think what he's trying to see is how realistic is it that I can legitimately improve my stock? 
this case was made yesterday with Tua Tonga Valoa. You know, there was all that talk, Jesse, that they're all coming back, he's coming back. At the end of the day, when he set and made a decision, whether he came out this year or next year, he was going to be the number two quarterback taken in the draft. Even if he proves to be 100% healthy a year from now, Trevor Lawrence is going to get picked over him. Okay? And he's bigger mine. and more durable. Yeah. And fields mine. And fields mine. Mine. And this year, Joe Burrow is going to get picked over him. And maybe, maybe the kid from Oregon, you no, know, is, is going to. So what he looked at was I can't improve my stock a whole lot. Whereas Trey's situation is how much can I legitimately improve my stock? And I think that at the end of the day, because if you can go from the third round to the latter part of the first round, first part of the second round, that's a big jump in money. That's a huge change in money as opposed to being a guy who's the eighth pick of the draft or the 15th pick of the draft, which is kind of where Tua was. I will say, I will say that the similarities between Trey and Tua from, from my perspective is that Tua was also either he or his camp or whatever was trying to combat the notion that, you know, he's brittle, that he can't stay healthy, you know, he's been beat up all three years. He could not answer that question by coming back to college and, and playing for free. For If he stayed healthy for 12 games, then okay, but he could have stayed healthy for 12 games in the NFL. Similarly, I don't know how Trey's going to get said answers that he's looking for medically because it's such a – there's just not a lot of evidence out there, you know, with, with, with professional athletes dealing with this sort of – of issue, so I don't know how he, how a he gets the answers that he's looking for either way. That says you're not at risk or you are at risk or whatever by coming back and proving. I get that in a in a vacuum on the field he could improve his stock. I don't know, and it would be my advice that hey, why risk it coming back? Go third round, whatever. Go go get your go ahead and secure your financial future and start that. Clock. That's the way. If I'm if I'm Trey Smith, any more football I play, I'm getting paid for. And that, 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 this is just my to, personal opinion. Yeah, I, but I it's just, but it's a I mean it's a roll of the dice no matter what. Yeah, and and I don't know how he gets that answer. You know, in terms of medically, how what, what is going to be different? It's it okay? So that the plan worked uh, again, but then what? All of a sudden, what if it doesn't in, in his rookie season? You know, and and so I, I it, thought I thought it was interesting. You know, and, and, and nobody's as close to this situation from a media standpoint as Chris Lowe because Chris has developed a good relationship with Henry. with with Henry and Trey and Ashley. Um, I thought it was interesting when we were on The Nation Sunday night and he was talking about it. He talked about a year ago, you know, the whole notion that blood clots came back. And, you know, it, it sounds like it ended up just being more scar tissue than it was blood clots. On the second go-around. On the that second took, go-around. That took him off the field in the 2018 season. Yes, correct. So, like, you know, realistically, blood clots did not come back apparently last year, but they were being cautious with it. And um, to me, that's that's a positive, a positive sign and a layer to the story that I did not know. I thought that clotting came back a second time. That was the assumption that – you know, I rolled with when when he got pulled off the field. So to me, it's almost like he's been clot free for you know a, a lot a lot longer than we thought. Um, which, which, if you're the NFL, that may make him more appealing to you if you look at it and say, "Hey, you're two years removed from having anything." Yeah. See that again, like you that know? when when Lowe so, said that, I was it was a real eye opener for me because it was it was just different. I mean, I you know, I mean, has he reported that? Yeah, that was in the Sunday uh, or the. The story that ran the morning of, of, the, the, of game. the game that was in that. that was and I th- and I th- in light of that, and I, th- I mean, I think there's going to be. I mean, you know how NFL teams are. I mean, they're going to be cautious when you're handing out guaranteed contracts. But I don't. Even if Trey plays great and he comes back and plays great, I, I still think NFL teams would have question, some questions. Some well, questions. Ins- so if he was going to, so if he ended up go falling in the second round next year, but my point is if he goes like in the third round this year you, and has no problems, you get to that second contract a lot faster mm-hmm. as an NFL player, as opposed to five years if on your rookie deal for your first rounder, you get there you can get there in three. And that's been my that, that's right. kind of been my question this whole time and it's something I don't know the answer to, um, is you know, if he comes back, are the questions not gonna remain? That's what I mean, you know, I mean, and, and, and and that's that's you know because the the NFL is so particular, particular not peculiar, particular about the medical side well, of things. And when you're talking about guaranteed millions yeah. in a rookie deal, you know, I I just know that when talking to people, 
you know, in the last day or so, it, it you know, I, I'm not going to say he's for sure coming back. I'm just saying that it's, it's 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 trending that way more than I thought it was when we left Jacksonville. It seemed like oh, we had, talked about it on the field. It was he like, had, that guy was hugging he people had, and taking pictures. He wore that cowboy hat the last the last six weeks. It was like he was riding off into the sunset with the cowboy hat on. You know the way he interacted with people, the way he talked afterwards, um, just watching him. You know, kind of go around the stadium with the flag and all that stuff. It just seemed like it, he was soaking up every last second. Well, and I think again, I think the thing, key thing is he's got two weeks to make this decision. So it can trend a million different ways here over the course of the next, you know, because you got all kinds of emotions taking place right after the game. And I thought he handled himself really well with the media in terms of not getting into it. He made it very clear he thought he could have played a lot better this year and the challenges that he dealt with of not practicing, you know, and, and how that, you know, hurt him in his play. Um, but. You know that that's a decision he and his family have to make. I, I just think there's some there's some multiple layers to it because with him nothing is guaranteed. Whereas with some kids you have a decision. You know you look at it you're pretty guaranteed of where you are, where you're slotted in the draft, and you've got to decide can I come back and help myself or can I not? And so he, he's got a couple different things to think about. So that's the story to certainly continue to watch and talk about, and we will do that uh, over the next couple of weeks until Trey makes a formal final decision and announcement on what he's going to do. All right, let's jump into some recruiting right quick. Everybody wants to know, what are the names? What's the board look like? You know, and, and we've said here are some, some guys who are obviously on the board, Jay Hardy, um, Dee Beckwith, we know are on the board. Then the question after that is, what? How deep is the board? How big is the board? And, and where does Tennessee stand? You got the, the receiver out of Rock Hill, South Carolina, whose name is out there. But then some other guys look like maybe we're going to take visits, may not take visits. The St. John kid from up in St. Louis, um, you know, doesn't look like he's going to visit. You got the five star who's committed to Georgia that looks like he's going to come take a trip. And yeah, I guess anything can happen, but that seems like a long shot. Who am I missing on the board? What do we look like? Is this. Deep board, shallow board, medium board. I think it's board, a very small board. board. What do we got? I think it's a very small board. I think there'll be a name or two pop up in the month of January that come in here for a visit. But uh, I think for the most part, it's you know the guys we've outlined. They're gonna try to flip Jay Hardy. They're gonna try to land D Beckwith, Jakari Caldwell. Um, Is the kid in Rock Hill, South Carolina? Rock Hill, South Carolina. Um, obviously, uh, Roderick Jones. Um, Offensive lineman committed to Georgia. You know, I think ultimately Tennessee ends up. You know, if they land all those guys, you know, that's their dream scenario. But they could potentially have a spot or two left open for grad transfers because, you know, if, if you feel like you're a spot or two away, you know, and it's not going to hurt you towards the 21 class. Remember, you go back to those that first year and they took, you know, three guys and one, of, one, or, one or two were actually able to back count, back count, but not all of them. I don't think Jeremy wants to take away from the 21 class at all, but if he's got a spot or two left in this class, I think you know, if you can get a wide receiver that's got some experience or a, a, an edge pass rusher that's got some experience or an offensive lineman that's got some experience that can play right away and help you, that may, that may help this team more so than taking a flyer on another I mean, I, Cedric Tillman type player. I think that's a really smart move. I, mean, I almost think that's something you might see become standard operating procedure for – you know, unless you just hit a home run in December. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't. I, I like the idea of if you've got a spot or two available going that route, then signing a full 25 and then deciding to take a guy, and all of a sudden you take away from the following year's class. I mean, you just see it every year. I mean, grad transfers popping up and helping people. I mean, even, you know, I'm talking about stars. I mean, just, you know, right guard, wide receiver. You know, somebody that's that's competent, that's better, that's going to help your team more yeah. than, you know, like you know, like you just mentioned, some fre freshman that's not going to get on the field. And I wonder if some of the transfer stuff may slow down a little bit in the coming years because in talking to some people who have access to the portal, the number of guys that are out there looking for homes and haven't found them is pretty remarkable. I mean, you got you got a guy like Velas Jones who's been talked about on our board. He's tweeting out last night his highlights. Hey, I'm available. Which is a hey, I'm looking for some somebody call me. You know what I mean? That the phone's not ringing the way I thought it would be. The, and the, maybe Tennessee calls, but but, they, but I'm using him as a, yeah. as an example because Tennessee fans know him. Point being, all these guys who think the grass is greener and that everybody's going to just come like they did in recruiting. Coaches are being select with grad transfers because what coaches have realized is they're costly because they cost you an initial Jesse. So you're not going to. 
if you're going to take somebody, he better be a guy who could really help you right out of the gate and be a big time factor. Who can help you now? I think that's the key. Who who can help you now? I mean, you know, Tennessee fans. It was two weeks ago. uh, You know, we got all all three of us got all these questions about Robert Beal. You know, the, the, the former blue chipper, you know, a Georgia outside linebacker who had been leapfrogged on the depth chart by Nolan Smith and all these other guys. He was he he didn't play, but he ended up going through practice with Georgia and was standing on the sidelines during the Sugar Bowl. You know, I mean, he he may end up just sticking around because he can't. You know, not everybody's calling. Not, not everybody's calling. Right. So, and and I think that's the thing. That, look, some positions, you know, guys are going to land at home. An offensive lineman's always going to land somewhere if he wants to be a grad transfer because there's always a team that has got a coaching turnover. There's always somebody who needs an offense, an offensive lineman. So if you're an offensive lineman with some experience at the Power 5 level, you're going to land somewhere. Same for a quarterback. Receiver, because, because, because a freshman high school offensive lineman's not ready most of the time. You've got to develop him. So the offensive lineman, hey, if he's played in 30 games in the SEC, he's a plug-and-play guy, a la Ryan Johnson. Drew Richmond going to SC. Wide receivers, hey, freshman wide receivers make impacts all the time. So suddenly those guys aren't as, as attractive. You know, that's not as big of a deal. Same for, you know, um, defensive ends or, or defensive backs, you know, running backs. I mean, if you're a running back who's transferring out, unless you're, you know, a stud. At, unless you were at Alabama when they had, you know, whatever that tweet was, when they had Derrick Henry and Alvin Kamara and, um, Kenyon Drake and whoever the fourth NFL Josh back Jenkins was. You know, they had four else. NFL backs on the Damian roster. Harris. You know, that's that makes sense. But most of the time, those guys aren't, aren't good enough to play. So I think you're going to see coaches be selective. But I'm with you, Rob. I think you're going to see coaches hold those just in case and not just take a guy to fill a roster spot. And Tennessee has gotten this roster to the point. Uh, where they don't have to take a guy just to take a guy to fill a roster Well, and also, don't you think Jeremy's looking at a couple of those decisions he made to take a guy just to take a guy the first two years and is like, eh, I, maybe I would have been better served to have that one available in May. When, you know, when it was t- or, or to carry it over to the next year and as opposed to just taking a guy just to, to plug a hole. You know, because, again, as I've said it many times, you know, scholarship's the most valuable thing Coach owns. Yeah, I mean, it, it, either – reached on a guy like Cedric Tillman, who, I mean, at least has played some for you. I mean, even like Karak Garland was a reach, and he, he's become one of your more effective defensive linemen at points this year. So, um, it's one of those things where I, each coach has to weigh, you know, can that kid help you? Yeah. You know, can, you know, I mean, like Velas Jones, there's a reason he just returned kicks, and that's kind of it at USC. I mean, you know, there's a reason he was in that situation to begin with. I, every fan, and, that, and that's why he's tweeting out, "Somebody come yeah, recruit." Every me. fan loves the guy that was a former five star, former four star, or sure. whatever. That's a name, you know. I, there's a reason those kids leave those schools. Very few. There's very few Cam Newton, Alvin Kamara type stories. Most of the stories are the guys that you know they left for a reason, and you know they didn't play when they got to the next stop. Yeah, and that's why it'll be it'll be quite interesting to see. You know, because he'll, he'll generate plenty of buzz, I'm sure, this spring. But what sort of impact does D'Angelo Gibbs actually have for yeah. Tennessee next season? Yeah, I mean, it, obviously he's got a lot of buzz off of Right. Aubrey Solomon was good for Tennessee. You know, that, that was that was a good – but I mean, by no means was he a savior to the yeah, defensive line. He, he was good. He was good. But fans thought they were – because he had five-star attached to his mm-hmm. name, they were going to get a guy that was going to be Derrick Brown. Right. And he was just a rotational guy. Again, Solomon was productive. He was solid, but he wasn't Derek. But, but you see Dawson's sport. You know, you, you see former five star coming. Which here. goes back to the which goes back to the notion that I've I've been saying about Harrison Bailey. I think Harrison Bailey's going to be a really good player, but putting way, too much weight on this kid's back to roll in here and be, you know, Peyton Manning slash Lamar Jackson slash. Tom Brady all coming in here to, to save the to There's save the program. There's a difference there because it I know. No, no, I get it. But I mean, like the fans just naturally put this this un, this weight on. Look at Jonathan Kongbo. He came from the JUCO rank, so he had at least a couple hey, of hey, years. Hey, he was the number one pick in the CFL draft, brother. Yeah, you need to slow down. He, he had the, in the NFL. He had he the, got signed. He, he had the, the the scoop ice cream with Bob Shoup. but. You know, everybody thought he came in. He's going to be. He's going to be. Dare- I know. I mean, that's rec- that's. I mean, that's that's our business. That's what 
That's the, that's what makes. I mean, that's the intrigue of the business. Is you put who's going to hit, start, who's not, who's going right. to not. But you then you a, see. I mean, the reason you see Trevor Lawrence, you see Justin Fields, and that kind of stuff. I mean, that fuels it. You know, sure. Why not my guy? Yeah. Why not my guy? Yeah. I agree with that. I mean, and that's. I mean, there's been enough five stars that have landed here that were good players right out of the gate, and you go, well, okay, Barry. you know, why not? Yeah. Why not one of those? And that's. That's where a coach has to evaluate for himself and, and not based on just the list and that type of thing. But to, to your point about the, the transfers, what's interesting about the grad transfers, and I think the point you were making, lots of times people don't look at the production that they had in college when they transferred. They just revert back to what the profile looks like at a high school yeah. and the number of stars they had. Because, look, there's an unknown with Harrison Bailey as a four or five star, okay, because nobody's seen it yet. But a four-star or five-star who's leaving a school, using Velas Jones as an example, who's only returned kicks, guess what? He, he, he was overrated coming out of high school. That doesn't mean you're getting a four-star who's like, I, I, I mean, if you were re-ranking him, he wouldn't be a four-star is my point. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that's the intrigue part of grad transfers. All right, let's get to hoops right quick, Rob. Um, all right, we we weren't gonna they weren't gonna play him. Then they were, they were gonna play him some, and then they started him, and now he's the savior, Santiago. Right? Man, I was blown away by how good the kid was. Blown away, and and, and that's not based. I mean, I, I that's based on what people were telling me because I, I saw the kid practice for thirty minutes before he played. Ten minutes of that was five on five stuff, and two weeks before that, I had somebody who I would just say is very close to the situation tell me that he ninety nine percent was gonna redshirt. And so, you know, Lamonte's injury affected that to some degree, but even outside of Lamonte's injury, I mean, the coaches staffed at a 180. Once the kid got on the court here, I mean, I think he blew Rick away, not just with his ability, but how much. I mean, they'd send him some tapes and stuff to look at, but I don't think anybody had any idea that he would be as diligent and as competent in, in picking up what they were doing just, just on his own, just by watching, by, you know, having phone conversations, asking questions. And, um, I mean, he was, he was a long way from perfect. I mean, he was really bad defensively. He had nine turnovers. I was going to say, don't, I mean, don't, yeah. don't everybody need to pump the brakes. Yeah, I mean, that this guy's not suddenly going to get this but, team in the tournament. But what he did coming in seven days after being on campus with, with five practices, a couple of film sessions, I mean, it's remarkable, man. You can't downplay it. I mean, six and nine from, from three point range. I mean, that dropped a couple of dimes that just nobody, that were plays nobody else on this team could make in terms of court vision, awareness, feel for the game. And, um, I mean, I don't think it's going to make a, make a huge difference this year. I mean, I think Tennessee, I'm just kind of, kind of come around to thinking that Tennessee's a not very good basketball team. But for what it means for next year, for what it means with him playing with the guys that are coming in, I think there's a lot to be excited about. I mean, he's way better than I expected. And, again, I'm just parroting back what people were telling me. I mean, everybody over here was telling me, man, he's going to be a really good player, but he needs some time. You know, it's going to take a little while. I don't think anybody expected him to be as good as he is right now. And I was really impressed. Yeah, he's got a lot of stuff to work on, but there, there is clearly – a lot to like about him. How do they mask him defensively? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, mean that, that's where I mean that's where losing I mean, Lamonte play a zone. If, I mean, what are you going to do? I don't think Rick's going to play a zone. I mean, but I, <laughs> I don't think Rick's going to play a zone. I mean, no, I mean, I think I mean I think Rick's going to try to coach him up. I mean, he he does some things well. I mean, he moves well. I just think that he's he's not played very much against the kind of quickness and, and athleticism he's going to see in this league. And and you know, Javante Smart in particular took took advantage of him with with some triple penetration the other day. But I think the more he sees that, the more he understands Tennessee's defensive concepts, he'll get a little better about it. I mean, he's not going to be great by any stretch of the imagination. But, um, you know, I, I think that what he's bringing to the table, you know, really outweighs that. All right, so what do they do to get Jordan Powell? I don't fixed? know, man. Just, I, mean, I, that, that, I mean, look, I love Jordan Powell, but same that here. was rough. And, and, and the, one, the game LSU. before w was rough against Wisconsin. Now, I mean, it, shot's not even close to the rim. Three for 25 in the last two games. And I just – I think I think part of it is Jordan struggling with the burden of having to be the guy, the first option. He's never been in that role here. I mean, I think the role he was in last year was, was perfect for him as, as option four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he was Alfred, or, or and then he went to Robin, and now he's Batman. Or some and now nights, Batman. You know, some nights Jordan, you know, could step up and, and and really make you pay for the way you were playing Grant and Admiral, and you know, and, and would look like the number one option. But it was because nobody, you know, he was like he was the third guy in the scouting report. Now, Maybe he was Commissioner Gordon. Now, Either way, he now, was not bad. I mean, I think, I think he's struggling mentally with the pressure of knowing he has to go out there and get 16, 18, 20 points for, for Tennessee to have a chance. And I think he's struggling with all the defensive attention he's getting from being the guy that when the opposing coach 
gets the guys in the film room and starts getting up on the dry race board, he's the guy that they're talking about taking away. I think they're making it tougher to get the ball where he wants it. When he does get it, they're crowding him, making it put put it on the floor. They're you know shading things his way, and and he's having a hard time coming up with with counters to that. Yeah, he's got to find a way to get to the free throw line, which is not well. This whole team does. Yeah, that, none that's, of them get to the free throw. I mean, the, the five. I mean, they didn't shoot their first free throw the other day. There was eleven minutes left of the game against LSU, and that wasn't because of bad officiating. It's because they don't have a beast in the post that can go in there and you know demand you play him tough or, and hard, or he's going to he's going to get to the rim every time like Grant would. And they don't have guards that you know that that penetrate and get get to the rack either. That's, that's a big shortcoming. Yeah, I mean, this team clearly misses a couple guys who transferred out of this program for various reasons. So the question then becomes, where's help in the post coming? Because, I don't think it's, look, here. it's not coming. Well, I mean, for the future, where's oh, it coming? Well, I mean, Yurosh I mean, is... Not, look, it's not on this roster. Okay? Oh, Yurosh is going to get eligible, and Corey Walker is a really, really, really good inside scorer. Really good. So help's coming that Help's way. coming. And you're, I mean, if you're... I had people, like... Very, very <coughs> close to the program tell me that even if Plavchik was eligible, that Fulkerson was going to start, I, I, I don't believe that anymore. I mean, maybe it would have been a token situation like when Pond started last year and came out at the first TV timeout, but I've seen enough practices where, I mean, Plavchik is, maybe, is not going to give you a ton offensively, but he, he's going to rebound and at seven foot one, 240 pounds, I mean, he's, going to, he's a defensive presence in the paint. He would have, he would have helped this team immensely. All I mean, right. LSU just, just Beat them up in the, right. the paint. Just, and that's going to happen night in and night a out. A lot of front. times in the SEC. All right, so you know, they're playing Missouri tonight. That's going to be a physical defensive game. You know how that's going to play. Big picture here as a, as a final question. How much better can this team get this I don't, year? I don't what, know. What's the ceiling on I mean, I think the ceiling, this ceiling, it, to me, if they go 500 in conference play, I think that's great. And, and, I'm, I mean, I'm, and I don't know if they can do it. It's um, – because the back end of this conference schedule is brutal. hard. I mean, they need to. I wrote this in the three, two, one yesterday. I mean, they their first seven SEC games are, are, are pretty easy. I mean, LSU is the best team they play. They caught them at home. That's already you know already lost that one. Problem is they're trying to find their footing with 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 the new kid and, and trying to get out of the slump of Bowden. By the time that all happens, all of a sudden you you may be playing better basketball, but you're. You're playing better teams. Yeah, I mean, I think they'll get better. Just, I mean, you know, I mean, I think Rick will, will develop them to get better. I just don't know that it's going to matter that much. I mean, I just don't think they're offensively. I mean, they scored 64 points the other day, and it felt like an explosion. Well, they made nine, <laughs> I mean, they, they made 13 three pointers in the game. Yeah, right. They shot. They made 13 to 26 from three and, and scored 64 points. Right. That's and it got beat double digits. Yeah, and that's. I mean, that's a bad, bad sign. Yeah, certainly is. So challenges for this basketball team so tonight on the road in Missouri. We'll have coverage of that as well, and plenty of coverage on the coaching searches and. Uh, what shakes out with the assistant coaches and recruiting as coaches get ready to go back on the road here in about 10 days as well. That's going to do it for this edition of the VolQuest.com podcast. For Jesse Simonton, Austin Price, and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubbs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great Tuesday, everybody.